How we doing? Oh, doing pretty good, good. coach. Good. Hey, a couple. Um, okay. Um, Arthur said early on that uh, Taquan has done a lot of great things. Well, what would you say has been sticking out to you in his first uh, three games? And who who are you talking about? Taquan Brown. Uh, um, he's doing he's doing a lot of things well. He's doing playing well, playing. Uh, uh, been playing to run well, learning the system. He's been playing well. Team of the year, then. Whether it's a guy like Grady or even on the offensive side of the ball, like guys like Lindstrom and Jake that have gone against the same guy over and over and over again throughout the course of their career. Well, how does that change things for you as a coordinator? Well, it's just the information that they give me that maybe they know about the guy, you know, whether to exploit him or stay away from him, you know, one way or the other. It doesn't always mean something that you're going to try to go good against me, you may go the other way. You may say, hey, this is not a good guy to try to do a pass rush game on. He's not going to, he's smart, he's stout, whatever. I mean, it's whatever information they can give you on a guy. You just try to use it within the scheme that you have. You don't try to go crazy on it, but, uh, you know, it's just like, Defensive backs should have a book on all receivers that they go against. And it's this guy, what's he doing press? What's he doing off? What's he doing his breaks? Does he have top end speed? They should know that. And accordingly, if they know something about a guy particularly, um, they should always, just like us, we share information with the players. Players share information with us. Uh, and then we'll go back to last Sunday. The two five four. Uh, that's what at least I was calling it, alignment, where you have basically five linebackers on the field. Mm -hmm. Can you walk me through that and what you were trying to get out of no. that? Also? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I tell you what I'm trying to know. do, Michael? Because you're generally helpful. <laughs> I'll tell you, we played it. Yeah. Hey, the more you can do, if we can get a guy on the field and he can contribute in some way, then and I feel like he can give us something diff different on defense, then we'll try to get him, fit him in, and we'll try to make the system fit him and use him. Why? Why have a guy sitting on the bench that can play? You know, if uh, if a guy can play, then try to figure out what, is there something we can do to get him on the field without taking really somebody else off or is, is going to be useful. That's all you do. You just try to put guys in positions where they can help you. So it's more of a personnel decision than like a Seattle? Not necessarily. It could be both. could be both. What do you get out of that? Like what, I'm just trying to understand what, you, like what that type of alignment maybe gives something, you. Something, obviously. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't put it out there if we didn't think we'd get something out of it. I would never. Why would I ever tell you anything about scheme? I never would. My guys are saying the linebackers turn into ends, and it's a four-three over. But you know, we you don't want to talk about whatever you think. Yeah. Hey, the Browns in the running game. What's the challenge that you're facing? Whatever alignment you all run out there. Well, first of all, they got a heck of an offensive line. It's all worked together. They're a veteran group. They're very, very talented. I think it's probably the best, if not at least one of the best offensive lines in the league. Their tandem of backs. I mean, either one of them could be. Starters on every team probably in the league. I mean, Chubb and Hunter, they're, they're both. I mean, 24 goes out and 27 comes in. There ain't a whole lot of drop off. So they're just two great, great talented backs. It's, it's the best tandem of two backs, you know, I've, I think I've ever been around, you know, combined together. You know, I'm not saying that that's not taking anything away from any one guy. I thought that back from Seattle was a, you know, Perry's really, really good back. And, but can you imagine having him and the same guy right behind him? And, and you know, um, I mean, they, they had a good group of backs, but the, these two guys are special. How has Brissett been able to use the other weapons, uh, Amari Cooper and uh, David Njoku? Well, the thing of it is is that everybody's really, you know, you, you got to geek up to play the run game. I mean, you can't just sit there and just play your, you know, vanilla defense all the time. And, and what happens is that – that's an asset. Anytime you get the running game going, it's always going to be an asset to the passing game because guys are going to you're going to pull linebackers up to play the run. You're going to get secondary guys to bite on the run. Uh, anytime the running game is strong, usually the passing game's got a chance then too. And they do a good job with you know the play action, the boots, the quick game, all that stuff. You know, and if you look at them, they don't get into a lot of third and longs. They're very third and manageable. It's not like you're sitting back there teeing off as a pass rusher because it's third down and eight or third and ten. There ain't a lot of those. It's third and three, so now what do you do as a pass rusher? 
if, if I rush, if they do pass it, the ball's coming out quick, and I got to be afraid that they're going to run it. And third and three means nothing to them, third and four. And I just, you know, I see it around the league trend more and more. The other night I was watching, just caught a piece of the Monday night game, and one time New York blitzed, I think, on third down and eight, and they, Dallas ran the ball for 20. You know, you're, you're always susceptible to the run when you start pressuring and running zone pressures and doing all these fancy things and doing all the, that stuff, simulated pressures and all that stuff. And they run it, you know, you got backs that come, all you got to do is break one tackle and they're, they're, they're in pretty good shape. And uh, what do you remember for how rugged the AFC North games were? Um, you know, the Falcons haven't um, done pretty well against the AFC North last, uh, eight, last couple cycles. Well, I hope that continues. And just, but that is, a, it's a tough, it's a tough division. I mean, it, it's having been at Baltimore for eight years. I mean, going against the Steelers was was always rough, and Cleveland's always been a physical team. Uh, Cincinnati too. I mean, it's it's a tough division, but you know what? They're all tough. I mean, if you start thinking about the NFC North too, and you look back at Green Bay and the old days of Green Bay and Chicago and Detroit, those were physical black and blue games. Hey, our games in this division are black and blue too. And then I just think about us, even when I was at Tennessee and we play Indy, those were bad. everybody's everybody's leagues physical. I mean, there's some teams that maybe aren't as much, a little more finesse, but they're always there's always teams in every division that are very physical. And Cleveland's certainly one of them. The more you face a court, you face a quarterback. Who, who has the advantage as that goes down the line? You know, and on the third on the third go round, do you feel like you're in better shape or he's in better shape because of the way you know each other? It probably depends on if they're at the same team. Okay. So if you're playing the same quarterback at the same team, he probably now kind of has an idea how we approach him. So he may have a little bit of advantage in some ways if there is one. Um, you got to be careful as a coordinator not to be keep repeating the same stuff you've run against him before. It, it's always hard because if you had success, if you go away from it and you don't have success, then you say, well, why did I change? Did they fix it? But if you stay with the same thing and then they beat you, everybody's going to say, well, yeah, you stayed with the same thing. He, he's going to beat you. So you're, you know, it's catch 22. But it's, it's, I'd say if it's the same guy in the same system, the quarterback does, but if he changes system, what you did to him at the other place may not be anything that you do with him at this place because it could be a wholly different system. Like if if J Jacoby was in a system where they threw the ball 50 times a game, that's one way of playing him, right? And then you go to Cleveland and we don't throw it 50 times a game, we run it 40 times a game. Well, it's a different system, so the stuff that I, we're going to do, there isn't to me, I don't know that there's any advantage in his case necessarily other than he has seen some of our stuff, but are we going to run that same stuff because it's a totally different system. That's what he's – it's going to be whatever – it's whatever the coordinator up there thinks, the head coach in this case and coordinator. Do, do you personally enjoy one over the other? By that I mean facing a guy who's brand new or a guy that you have some experience against and so you're kind of playing this cat and mouse game. It, it, I don't know that I really – look at it in either case is that much it's kind of fun sometimes when you play the same guy all the time in kind of the same system just because it's a cat and mouse thing a little bit but at the same time as you're hoping that when you play somebody that's in a different system that doesn't know what you're going to do that you can get them so you know it's all about hey whatever the advantage is to winning that's what I'm all about I don't really care about the rest of it were you a Browns guy growing up all oh, big Eagles guy I, we were just talking, John. So you, you could only watch two teams in in my house, and that was Cleveland Browns and Ohio State. If somebody else was on, if back then when they had blackouts and stuff like that, we, we watched a movie. We didn't even watch another <laughs> game. We didn't even watch another game. I I can remember one time wanting to watch Green Bay, and they, nah, we're watching a movie. Uh, all right. I mean, it was it was Cleveland, or Ohio State, or nobody. That was what it was. Mike was there. A movie that, like, what movie? No, was it, it, it didn't. It didn't matter. It just is. That the point was, I might as well go outside and play in the yard and get a football game going up because there's. I wasn't going to be watching Browns if they, they were blacked out or not in town. So yeah, I was big time Browns fan. Bob Gain, all those guys. I can name a lot of old players. You guys wouldn't even know. <laughs> hmm? 
Troy Anderson. Um, I can't help but think that he may be one of those players that you were thinking about. With the, I think he was in that 2-5-4 uh, formation. Um, can you just talk about his general progression over these first few games? Because he's certainly playing, I think, a lot more than – Well, he's – he's um, you know, we've – obviously, we drafted him. thought he was a heck of an athlete, smart kid. Guy has played a lot of different positions, very unselfish player. Um, just feel like he's got some physical – uh, attributes that we would like to exploit and use and try to put him in situations that aren't going to be overwhelming as a rookie. So rather than him knowing all the system and everything else, kind of, okay, here's maybe your spot to maybe play and learn it real well. And last uh, week we used 55, Nate, on a couple of occasions. I just, we saw some things in practice. We've been watching them. We, there's some things that we thought, okay, maybe this guy could help us in this situation. So we found a few plays to sprinkle him in too. I don't know, five or six or whatever it was, but um, that's all you're ever doing. When you watch a guy out there practicing all the time and he's playing hard and you're going, boy, you know, that guy's, that guy's got some, some things about him. How can I use that? Well, and then you just try to plug it in where you can. It, it's, it's not only for our benefit, it's really kind of for those guys' benefit too. I mean, it keeps everybody very engaged in the game. The more guys you can get involved in the game plan, the more they're in tune to the whole game plan. Uh, I'll use it as an example one time, and I always thought this was one of the better things over the years that <laughs> kind of did was in 1986. I'm really dating myself on some of this stuff, but in 1986, I'm the defensive coordinator at Miami of Ohio. And we go down and play LSU, uh, second game of the season. And they had just beaten Texas A&M by 30 or something like that. And they're talking about, you know, what's the most, <laughs> most points ever scored on somebody at LSU. I mean, this is a night, night game, Saturday night, LSU. Here we are, little Miami of Ohio going down there. And we, our, our school colors are red and white. So we had a red team, a white team, and a black team. And so if you were a starting outside backer on the red team, the other starting backer was on the white team. And so everybody, we had, whoever went, we said got on the bus, was going to play. So like if you were starting corner on one team, you were the, the other starting corner was on the other team. And then the black team was the actual starters. So you had three deals. And we'd play them by series. We beat them 21 to 6. But I remember everybody, George Warren, and, and we scored, uh, we got six picks in that game. And, but everybody played, but it, the, everybody was so engaged. You know, like it wasn't like a backup sitting over there saying, well, I'm never going to get in. No, you're, you're going to get in. You're going to play. And I really always kind of took that to try to involve as many guys as I can because the more guys are involved in it, the more engaged they are in the game plan. And it's always it's, it's worked out fairly well over the years. So I'll relay that story. I'm sure yeah, 1986. <laughs> 21 to 6, beat them. Last year you talked a lot about you know having safeties that knew both positions, having some safeties that knew corner, linebackers that knew every position. Do you feel like you have more players this year that are, for lack of a better term, interchangeable? In yeah, a little spots? bit. And part of that is because we've got, you know, you got Richie back, you got Hawk back, you got Eric Harris back, who, who, you know, sometimes he played. He played a lot against you know um, L.A., but not in other games. But the thing of it is, like I told you guys, that one day him and and Dean Marlowe are so engaged in this thing that they're they're talking to those guys. They're like coaches outside of the coaching room, and they, they just their their addition or their benefit to this team is so great in the back end back there because it's just you know. We, those other guys are young. Hawk's young. Richie's young. AJ's young. Uh, you know, Casey's a good one. He's kind of like when we had Fabian last year. You know, you have that other experienced guy. Yeah, they may have not have been in the system for a long time, but that's why we've been able to do some more things than we did a year ago is those guys all could carry over. And then, you know, last year it was like everybody was hearing it for the first time. Some of these guys are hearing it for the second time, but they are in a position that they can talk to the other guys that are hearing it the first time. Last year, they were all in the first time. So they couldn't tell, Eric Harris couldn't say, well, yeah, this is what he means when we leave the room, you know, and they're off by themselves and they're talking. Um, you know, it's, just, it's different that way. And so, you know, Rashawn Evans has been with us. Michael Walker had been with us. Those guys, they're all Grady. 
there's 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 a lot everybody talks about well there's all these changes in personnel and defense but there's a guys that have integrated that defense that were here last year that can now talk to the other players. We're sitting there in the cafeteria and they're asking a question. Grady can answer it. Walker can answer it. Rashawn can answer it. Those guys can answer it. Before last year, they're probably going, I don't know, we'll get back in the room and we'll ask coach, you know. So now they can answer it. And, it's, and it, you know what, it's always different. It, it always means more coming from another player than it does a coach. You know, we're, we're the coach. It, it's It's – you know, if, if I get after somebody on the field, it's one thing. If another player gets after another player on the field, total different attitude about it. You know, it's just, it, it means a whole lot more coming from those guys than it does us. I meant also, like, just where you can put guys. Like, it seems like you have more guys you can move well, inside they, or out. But that's what I'm saying. You can only do that when you understand the defense. If you only understand your position, you can't really get be interchangeable because you don't really know what the other guy's really supposed to do. Okay, if you're a, you're a safety and you know that guy's a cloud corner, but you don't know what cloud corner really means, well, you can't ever go play cloud corner. So you know, yeah, I know I can tell you what he 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 is, but I don't really know how he does it. Well, if you really understand what that guy does and what his responsibility is, I could put Eric Harris probably in at linebacker. Now he'd be you know too little and stuff to do that, but he would know where to go, where to line up, what he's supposed to do. So that makes those guys interchangeable. Uh, I did that at Baltimore a lot. I mean, we, you know, we had DBs playing linebacker a lot of times on third down because they understood what the guy does. And the more you stay in the same system and the more you have continuity, the better that becomes because that's also the guys that you draft, like the Richie Grants. And you draft guys like, like Anderson and those guys who you know can understand all this stuff and do stuff. So, you know, we were just talking about that. When you really look around the league and look at continuity, think of successful teams like New England, Pittsburgh Steelers, Baltimore Ravens, now Cleveland. I don't know how many years now Kevin's been there, but it's, it's starting to look like old Cleveland again. You know, when you had Paul Brown there forever and Blanton Collier forever, they're pretty damn good. So I'm just saying continuity. As a coaching staff, but continuity as a system makes a big difference too. Were you a Browns fan growing up? Yeah, as a kid, yeah. I was an 80s Browns fan as a kid growing up with all those teams and all those heartaches. Cool. Fumble, drive. But it's amazing how those players from that era are still held in such high regard. It's amazing. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole a little bit. Like, what do you remember about that? Like, because how old you were? Like, what seven? No, the elementary school, right? Going through it all. But I mean, as, on Monday morning, depending on how the Browns did, it affected your your life. Either you're going out in the playground happy, or you like wanted to stay inside for recess. Um, but no, it was. It's such a huge, especially when I was a kid, a huge Browns town. That um, you know, and that was before really free agency and everything else. So like when you were a kid growing up, like you knew the backups of the backups. Um, you could, you know, you fell in love with the roster because you knew everybody who they were. And some of them lived in your neighborhood because, you know, obviously the money was slightly different than it is today. But um, yeah, there's the fabric of that town, right? All, my whole family still lives there. So the fabric of that town is still Browns through and through. Um, and so, you know, you can obviously see why the, um, you know, why the fan base is what it is and they keep supporting and, but it was definitely, it had a direct effect on your life if the Browns won or lost that game Wait, as a kid. So do the Ragones actually root for the Browns on Sunday or do they root for you? No, no, no. I hope not. I got I to pull some people over there, but uh, no, I've been, I've been gone there uh, from Cleveland for so long. Uh, but all my, like I said, my siblings, I'm the youngest by 10 years. So the sibling, all my siblings are still there. Um, their spouses, uh, my um, my nieces and nephews, I'm sure, are still Browns fans, but hopefully not on Sunday. Yeah, what will be some of the challenges? Uh, you know, I know Miles Garrett's situation is up in the air, but uh, what are their defense present? Uh, yeah. Already got? Uh, first, you know, when you when you put the film on, um, I haven't played this defense in a few years um, against some of this personnel, and what the first thing that strikes you is the speed, the competitiveness and the aggression in which they play up front and with their backers. They got really good cover guys, but the way that they can attack the edges uh, with their personnel, the interior doesn't give enough credit. Um, I know obviously you have the stars outside, uh, but the inside guys, 
cause a lot of problems. Um, and so for us, it's a, it's a great challenge because each week in the NFL, you're presented different schemes to go against defensively. Um, each one has advantages uh, that the offense obviously has to take into account for. And for this one, it's their ability to penetrate, play aggressive, uh, change the line of scrimmage. And obviously, if they get you into passing situations, um, they can rush the passer. And I know it's not just the guys that everybody thinks about. Uh, they do a great job of pushing the pocket. They get, do a great job of taking the air out of the coverage. Um, and this is a really good unit overall. And it's something where our guys, you know, the more film we watch as a, as a um, staff and with the players, the respect is growing. And um, it's at a really high level right now. How is Phillips doing as he takes over for Walker in the middle there? Yeah, what they've had, right? And I think it's a little bit like what we do um, in terms of the next man comes in. If you have a helmet on that day, there's an expectation and a standard. And you can see it throughout their whole defense, regardless of who's been in and who's been out. Um, they've done a great job of preparing their guys uh, week in, week out to, um, to fulfill their tasks and obligations. And like I said before, this is going to be a great challenge for us offensively. Quarterbacks just naturally feel more comfortable with play action. Do you, when you get them in your system, do you find Well, I think that's, that's a good question. I think there's certain quarterbacks that I've been around um, that are. Some don't like to turn their back. Some rather see it all. Um, and so, again, right, there's, there's always that feeling out process uh, with quarterbacks, specifically when they come from college to the NFL. The younger they are, typically they haven't worked some of those actions. Um, that we asked them to do. And so, therefore, there's a little bit of a learning curve uh, when you obviously lose vision and then have to snap your eyes and find it again. Um, and some guys just have natural feel and play pass um, with their ability to get their eyes around, see areas, see space, uh, and throw balls into either tight windows or lead offensive players into the windows in which they want them to happen. And so, overall, there is a, there's a feeling out process for sure about the quarterback. I would say there's some that are – innately really good at it. Some train to be good at it, and some just, you know, it never happens for them. Where does Marcus fall in this case? Yeah, I think Marcus obviously has been, he's been exposed to so many different things offensively. You know, you go through his, you know, we've got a lot of lineage together. He grew up in the run and shoot, so did I. You know, in Hawaii, June Jones was the guy there in Hawaii, and every high school ran the run and shoot, so that's what he grew up in, right? And he obviously goes to Oregon. I worked with um, his OC and head coach at one point, uh, Coach Helfridge. I know what they ran with the RPO and the spread offense and the tempo. And so obviously he got to Tennessee and he experienced uh, with different coordinators and other multiple offenses. And then obviously last year in Las Vegas and the year prior. So Marcus has a really good pedigree in terms of what he's been asked to do. Uh, he's been exposed to a lot of things. So therefore, whatever we throw at him, he's probably had some familiarity with. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that he's very coachable. And uh, what we ask him to do, uh, he, tr he takes it to heart and he tries to do the best he possibly can. When you're a mobile guy like Marcus, is were you pointing at me when you said mobile? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because we, we know that you have that concrete that, feet. You, That's you know, the two of you have the exact. Look, I was told this being recruited. I'll never forget this. I went to a camp, and the guy goes, "You have a Division One arm with Division Three feet." And I said, "Well, what does that mean, sir?" And he's like, "I'm not sure your feet are good enough." So I've always held that with me right there. Uh, I was gonna say that. Uh, that, that's, that burns you a little bit, dude. No, nah, I don't think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> With Marcus, the fact, and it coming in by action, the fact that he is mobile, does that make it easier for him in some ways? Does that offer a different type of wrinkle versus a guy like maybe a Tom Brady or a Kirk Cousins that, that don't have that same type of mobility? Well, I mean, I can speak to Kirk. I, I mean, I was with Kirk, and Kirk is, is – his numbers have been unbelievable, but he's more mobile than people think, and he's obviously durable. Um, and I've got a ton of respect for Kirk. But in terms of Marcus, it's one of those things where, um, sure, I mean, again, your ability to escape is always, I would say, an advantage to a certain degree. I think what uh, quarterbacks that have that ability, the one thing is the fine line is staying in there, right, to make that throw, or, hey, no, I could probably leave. I have that ability and leaving too early. And I think Marcus uh, has done a great job of balancing that. And I always equate it to like the eighth grader who can dunk, right? He's probably not working on his mid-range jump shot. He's probably dunking on people, right? And the quarterback that can run, right, probably is not gonna hang in there just for the last second when he knows he can take off and go. And I think through the course of development, especially in the NFL, um, what Marcus has done a great job of is finding that balancing act 
um, of knowing when to run and more importantly, uh, picking the right times to do it. And I think he's done that. When you look at his first three weeks, how do you evaluate what he's done really? Where, well, where for me, it's, it's simple. Um, you know, Marcus is one of 11. That's how I look at it. I get he's the quarterback spot, and I get that gets a lot of attention, and it goes to the stat line right on the bottom of the TV, and there's a lot of things that get involved with it. The reality is is he's part of a group that we're trying to score points. So if he's, if he's involved in that or where he's helping advance the football, regardless of how that's done, like we don't get caught up in passing numbers, running numbers. We're trying to advance the ball, and we're trying to score points. So if Marcus is part of that equation that's helping us, obviously that shows – that we're moving the ball and we're doing some good things. Does it mean it's perfect? No. So from my evaluation, right, it's not about, you know, getting down to his numbers and things of that nature. It's about is he helping the offense score points? Is he putting us in good positions, not just in the pass game? Is he getting into the right run checks? So for me, it's an easy evaluation. You constantly see, hey, how do we do on offense, right? Was Marcus a part of that? Was the other 10 guys a part of that? How do we advance it, right? And then we obviously coach it up from there. But overall, right, we're, there's things that we definitely need to improve on. Um, going back to the fundamentals is always a big thing for all of us, coaches included. And, and that's obviously a stress point going against this defense this week because if you're not fundamentally sound, uh, they have the ability to take advantage of you. In, that R- in the RPO fumble late last Sunday, where was the mistake? Like, where was the communication of the mistake error there? You've been looking long enough. I won't go in the scheme, right? And that's just something, again, it, it goes back to the fact that going back to the fundamentals for all of us, right? Coaches included, what we're teaching, what we're coaching, and how guys are executing it. And again, that's one. There's other things that we did well. There's other things we need to improve on, and that's what the practice is for. How important is it to play the way that y'all want to play to avoid three and outs? When you say you all want to play, what do you mean? Establish the run game. I would imagine. Yeah, I think for time. us. Get, get, get lathered up a little bit. Sure. I think when you watch us, right, well, the most important thing that we're trying to do offensively, um, like I said before, is move the football. If that is first play of the game, like last week, moving the pocket to take the shot, if it's starting the game with a run, if it's starting with something else, our goal as, an, as offensive coaches and what we're trying to preach to the players is we're trying to put them in the best position. So whatever the defense is offering us, how we play, that's really our style. Uh, right now, obviously, we want to come off the ball a certain way. That's just not the offensive line. That's everybody. And again, the way we play, hopefully, with our tempo and our style and everything else, right, is to our advantage. And if it's not, right, that's what our adjustments are for. So again, it's more about what we need to do that week uh, to win the football game on offense. So um, was the fumble a ball handling issue? Um, you know, that, uh, that's not scheme related at that point. Sure it is. Do you know? It's all scheme related. <laughs> It's all scheme related, man. It's all fundamental related. It's everything else. D-Led, no Bernie Kozar questions? Come on. Come with me with something else. I'm a cypher guy. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, no Bernie? But you're not a Bernie guy. No, Does Bernie know that? Bernie, yeah, Bernie knows. I'm okay. Bernie. All right. Just making sure. Dude, I didn't like the Bill Okay. That was, that was yeah, it's part of my childhood, too. Yeah. There, D-Led. Yeah. Just like yours. Very See? East side. Look at yeah, you represent right. the east side there, D. Led. But so, I, yeah, okay, that's new to me then that that would be scheme related. All fundamentals, all scheme, all yeah. same. Like right. fumbling the snap too. That's, that's why we do QB center, D. Led, before every practice. You got to teach and put their hand up there, right? See, that's that's good. See, I've been around different quarterbacks though, right? Uh-huh. Some do it here, okay. right? I've been a part of a guy who did it like this and clamped it, uh-huh. and then you're going for the old Gator yeah, look. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. D. Led, get you out there for QB center. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm just, no, we're good, man. Get you out there. Experience. It's, it's a it's full experience for you. Expanding scheme. That's right. Throwing me off a little bit. Oh, come on, d yeah. How long do you know me for? Huh? We're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. I'm going to okay. ask you about Fort Errol. Um, There's a CP question. Yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> See, where were you with the CP I would have gone right down that one. Right. Yeah, I, again, I think it's been – obviously, I know what's happened over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, last year he had, um, you know, games in which you saw. And, and I've been with him in previous spots. So, 
And you saw what he did before I was even with him in other spots. Um, again, none of it's a surprise to me or any of us on the staff. We've obviously studied him. We know him. Um, Coach Preachy's done a great job with him. And um, it's one of those things where, again, it, it goes back to, I always will say this when it comes to run or pass game. I get where the stats go, but it does take everybody involved for it to be, obviously, a successful play, just like it takes everybody involved when it's not, and coaching included. And what I think CP has done a really good job of is he understands that, he understands the scheme, and I think the guys around CP understand his running style. And again, I give CP credit to the fact that the way he plays, right, he doesn't take shortcuts, he plays physical. Uh, you appreciate it about him. Um, but we have other players that are doing the exact same thing, right? And that's what we're trying to build here offensively. Um, obviously, we want to we play a certain brand of football that helps score points, right? That's the goal. What are some of the, um, what are some of the things that the Cleveland Browns special teams units present for you all? Well, Mike Prefer, he's been doing it for a long time, I believe 21st season in the NFL. Uh, he's done a great job of coaching special teams. Uh, his guys are going to be ready. They play fast, they're physical. They do a great job in the return game, getting on blocks, staying on blocks, getting vertical with the football. And then their punter, Brewer-Krez, he does a good job directional punting, has a strong leg. Um, he could flip the field with, with one punt. And he did it, you know, obviously a couple of years ago, he did it with Buffalo, led the league in net and gross punting, I believe, his last year in Buffalo. And then Cade York, strong leg kicker, rookie out of LSU, hit a game winner week one. So it's a great test and a great challenge for our guys this week. You didn't have to, uh, well, I know y'all look at the kickers anyway, but you, you said at that spot, but what, what did y'all, what was the book on Cade York coming out of college? I mean, he was consistent, strong leg kicker, uh, has good size. Um, and we liked his mindset coming out of college. It looked like they were flip-flopping their returners from Felton and uh, maybe going back to him. Uh, how do you all prepare for, for their return game? Just like every other week led, it's the NFL. They, every team has guys that could go to distance with the football. They have dynamic speed. Um, whoever they put back there, whether it's Felton, Shorts, um, you know, Ford, they put uh, Ross, Chester Rogers back there. Whoever they put back there, we have to do a great job getting off blocks, running with speed, and making sure that we finish on the football and finish with, you know, a tackle. That's the key. So no missed tackles, keep leverage on the football, and making sure that our kick and our coverage complement each other. When, when, if my memory is right, y'all haven't gotten to return a kickoff this year. We got one. You got one. One <laughs> versus the Rams for like 27 yards. Is, is that – a win for you if they're if they're going to boot it and give you the ball there. Do you chalk that up as a win? Is it frustrating that you don't get any opportunities? How do you handle it? It's not frustrating. You know, Aaron, you know, Aaron Judge just hit what, a 61st home run last night, and you got to make sure that you're swinging at the right pitches when it comes to kickoff return and punt return. So the biggest part for us as a return unit is decision making, making sure that we're not just trying to field every single punt, field every single return, because our our blocks and our return unit and the kick has to all complement and, and and mesh well together. So it's not frustrating because at the end of the day. The number one goal for our return unit is that our offense has the ball the very next play. So we don't want to make sure that we're giving them an extra possession because a lot of these games in the NFL, as we can watch week in and week out, are one possession ball games. So we don't want to give them an extra possession when it comes to that. So it's not frustrating. Our guys are being patient, and it still allows us to get better each and every week with our basic fundamentals. And that decision just comes down to the, the returner? Ret returner, returner or myself. Or and Coach Smith, it's all based on and based on what type of team we're going against, based on what type of kicks we're getting. So when it comes to that, we're just making sure we're making the right decision for our, our offense and for our team. Have you changed Cordero's kick return philosophy in some ways? Because in the past, it's always been, if I can, if I can literally catch the ball, I'm going to take it out. I don't necessarily say it was his philosophy, is whatever team he's with. I mean, he started off with Coach Prefer in Minnesota, and then he's worked with various coordinators prior. It's all based on the situation, based on each game, based on the coverage units we're going against, based on what type of return that we have in that week. For example, you know, he's been various places. If a team, like you're trying to run a, a, a big field return to the right, Okay, and you have a setup to where if they kick it all the way to the left, we want to go field return to the right. Well, if they kick it to the right, it's kind of hard to set up that field return. 
So now you're like, okay, that's not the right pitch to swing at. That's not the right ball to return. So it's all based on the return. It's based on the situation within the game. You could watch the Rams uh, Cardinals games this past weekend. There's two seconds left, end of half. They, the Cardinals kicked the ball deep. It's two seconds left, the end of half. So Brandon Powell took the ball out eight or nine deep from the end zone because it's probably going to be the last play of the half. You know, they have a better chance trying to get a big return than it being a touchback and just nailing the ball or trying to do a Hail Mary, something crazy like that. So it's all based on the game. I wouldn't say to answer your question is not Cordero's uh, philosophy. It's more so his ability and what he brings to the table for our return units. And it's based on our philosophy as a team and as a return unit. You mentioned Aaron Judge. Did you ever laugh with him at all in Fresno? No, I did not, unfortunately. I never got a chance to watch any of his ball games. So. No, my, my brothers were able to go to a couple of games, but I wasn't able to, right. yeah. Morstead made some news last weekend. Did you send him a text or anything? Oh, no, I did not send him a text. That was an unfortunate situation happened, but it's a great uh, learning lesson for, you know, various teams and special teams units throughout the league, just making sure that we're not beating ourselves and, uh, you know, doing things to put points on the board for the opponents. So it's a great situational play to learn from. And, you know, fortunately, those guys came out with the win. So that, that clip has been shown in your room this week? It will be shown in our room. And before I could even show it, the guys were already bringing it up to me before the game and, you know, as the week was going on. So. Was that just a, just a matter of they were pinned deep just so the, the yardage was different or was somebody in when, the wrong spot? When you have a backed up punt situation, you know, usually most punters are lined up about 14 to 15 yards away from the snap. Right. So, you know, you put the ball in the 15-yard line, they're going to be – you know, hills on the goal line. But once you start to get into that five yard line area, now the punt, okay, so going back, 15 yards. So the punt block, the where the balls could be blocked at is about nine to 10 yards. That's the block point. Well, when you back up and you get that ball inside the five yard line, it shortens the block point. That makes sense, Josh. So it shortens up the block point. So now that ball's on the one yard line. So now the block point is even shorter. So he has to get the ball off of one step. He can't take his normal approach because now there's what, 11 yards. So he has to do a one step, get the ball, try to keep the block point at nine yards. As a punt pro team, you can't get as much depth when it comes to protection because they're that much closer to the football. So when you talk to your, your interior, your front line on punt pro, they got to shorten up their sets. The personal protector, proven like the example for Sheffield, the, the personal protector, whether it's our team or any other team, they want to shorten up their blocks. They can't back up in normal punt or especially in backed up punt. And in that situation, the, the PP backs up and ends up going off of him and being a safety. So that's a great learnable lesson and it's a great situational awareness for us to learn from so that doesn't happen to us.